I'd like to thank all the organizers for the invitation. Thank you for the nice introduction. And then just the one thing is like, if you post a question in the chat and I happen to miss it, please feel free to speak up. I would be happy to address any of the questions. Today, I would like to talk about the joint work with Frank Caragari and Vasily Dimitrov on applications of the arithmetic holonomicity theorems. And so I would like to first talk about the first application that some of you may already heard one of us speaking on the unbounded denominator conjecture. Then I would like to use that as an opportunity to kind of motivate the so-called arithmetic holonomy theorem. And then I'll give another application to periodic zeta values. So let me start from the unbounded denominator conjecture situation is, so we consider finite index subgroups and there's a special type called the principal congruence subgroup which are the elements congruent to the identity matrix mod N. And so this helps us to like see two types of subgroups. One is the so-called congruence one, namely those ones can be defined using congruence conditions and the other ones we call them non-congruence subgroups. And the question is like, could we just like distinguish these two types of subgroups other than just this definition? And it goes back to the work of Art King, Schwent, and Dyer, where they proposed in the conference in 1968. And they said that conjecturally, one could study the free coefficients of the module forms uh, with level to these like to the finite index subgroup gamma and try to distinguish whether gamma is congruent or not congruent. And to set up some notations, and I would like to recall a classical example goes back to the work of Klein and the free. And so we start from the lambda function, namely it's like the Hopton modulo of like individual curve with a level two, full level two structure. And it could be concretely write down as this Q extension. Um, the formula doesn't really matter for us. What's important is lambda over 16 is a Q expansion. I forgot to write that Q equals to, here Q equals to um, pi i, e to the pi i tau. So the important thing is like this lambda function as a Q expansion has Z coefficient and the moreover is like, it doesn't have constant term and the leading term for Q, it has coefficients one. So this is the important thing for us about like lambda over 16. And uh, so we could study like finite index subgroups of gamma two, which coming from like coverings of like C minus two points. So like one easy covering was coming from like the like nth power map. And this gives us a, like a finite index subgroup whose Hopton modulo is nothing but we take the Nth roots of like lambda over 16. And the work of Klein and Frick, they said that this group gamma n is congruent if and only if n divides eight. So one could actually do a computation in this special case by just like compute what are the possible like, um, a bit, sorry, what one can do a like concrete computation to see which ones are congruent or not. But for the purpose of today's talk, I would like to mention the observation here is like, if we take the ace roots, um, another thing that we use from the formula above is if we take the ace roots, it still have integer coefficients. But if we take, for instance, the third root, then we can actually compute the free coefficient and see that we have denominators show up and the denominators here show up as three. So that's why like we do see if we just, like take all the facts and try to make observations, we see that the relation whether like a subgroup, a finite index subgroup in this particular case being congruent or not is related to when we look at the um, four coefficients of the Hopton module, whether it has denominators or not. And more generally, we don't need to talk about the weight zero module form. We can talk about module forms of with K and the level gamma. And for today's talk, we do not, we allow ourselves to have module forms, which has like, which is meromorphic at the cusps. And when we talk about Q expansion, of course, we could talk about Q expansion at all the cusps, but like just the for simplicity for today's talk or just the like, and go also like, mm, compatible with the literature, we usually here just take the Q expansion at the cusp I infinity. 
And um, also, as we'll see from the proof, it's like, uh, usually the Q expansion, since we allow meromorphicity at cusp, it will start from some like N zero, but like taking the situation that N equals to assuming it's holomorphic at one cusp will still give us the essential case of the conjecture. And the other cases can be easily reduced to the essential case. So usually when we talk of module forms as holomorphic functions, we have real coefficients to be complex numbers. Um, but actually indeed we could study like just the module forms with three coefficients over Q bar is because like all these module curves can be defined over Q bar. And uh, the entire space of module forms is been spanned by three module forms defined over Q bar. So that's why, okay. So I think I made a couple of reduction steps as like for today's talk, we talk about no module forms. We are not meromorphic at all the cusps, but like for simplicity, we assume it's holomorphic at one cusp, and we only consider module forms whose coefficient is like in Q bar. And this already sees, helps us to see like all the module forms like with, with respect to say one like finite index of Q gamma. And now we are actually at the point that we could formulate the conjecture. Conjecture says the following. So we can observe two things. Given a module form with like Q expansion at I infinity inside uh, with coefficient for coefficients in Q bar. And the two things are equivalent. One is that, so it doesn't, essentially it doesn't have denominator or it has bounded denominator, namely that we can use an integer to clean up all the denominators of the Fourier coefficients, which if use, okay, let me actually flip a couple of slides back and go back to the example of like the third root of lambda, although I did not write out all the coefficients, but from the first couple of things, it seems that at least for this example, it's like the power of three is getting larger and larger when we do this kind of third root situation. So that's, um, in first case, it's like, we don't allow the denominator to get larger and larger. So we study these module forms. And the second part is saying that this module form is equivalent to say that the level of the module form is actually congruent. By the level, it means the largest the possible gamma, such that F satisfies the transition law for the module form. And the conjecture of the theorem says that these two things are the same. So let me first uh, make a remark about like congruent, why congruence module form has like bounded denominators. That comes from the situation is like when we have congruence, like level, we, we have the classical hex theory, which decompose all the holomorphic module forms into um, summation of hex eigenforms. And we also know that the, the norm for the normalized hex eigenforms, all the free coefficients are algebraic integers. And hence, like for congruence module forms, we can we first reduce to the holomorphic case and decompose into hex eigenforms. Then we have things which satisfy condition one. So that is like relatively classical and which also motivates the conjecture in the still the same paper of Atkin and Schoen Daya. They did some computations and they expect the situation to be true for like all the like, just um, for the non congruence ones, the module forms are not congruent. And this is like proved in the recent work of um, Frank Caragari, Vasily Dimitri and myself. Okay, so to motivate the title, the title of the talk says like the uh, arithmetic conomicity theorem. And uh, I would like to give a sketch of the idea of the proof and to hint on like why such a theorem will be relevant to us. Okay, so the idea of proof is like it's standard that people can reduce the theorem, the proof of the theorem to the weight zero case. And then we're going to fix an N, which is the least common multiple of all the cusps width of gamma. And uh, now it's like we have with zero case, namely that we look at all the module functions, namely these are like um, rational functions with restricted pole because we only allow pole at uh, infinity. And so basically it's like uh, rational functions over the module curve defined by the level gamma. So that's why it's a finite dimensional vector space if we view it as a dimension, as a vector space over 
over the J line or like crossing this, they will study it over the like lambda line. And this, that is fine as far as we take the intersection of our um, group with like gamma two. That is doesn't change like um, the asymptotic. Okay, so this is one thing is like we know that at least for the congruent situation. So actually more precisely here it is, is like um, the number N here, which is the least common multiple of the cusp width is called the Wolfert level. And in the work of Wolfert, um, he proved that if we have a congruence module form, so like condition one says bounded denominator. So like assumption two says congruence. So for by the work of Wolfert, he proved that if we have a congruence, if we know our prior module form has level which is congruence, and we know that the like this common multiple of the cusp width is n, then he proved that this group gamma or like this module form must be kind of of level. The group gamma must contain gamma n, the module form must have level gamma n, and that's why we can actually count the dimension in this case just by the index of the group gamma n inside SL2z. All right, sorry, all right typo here, it's kind of switched the order of the index. And then in this case, we can compute it's like asymptotically n cube. So in this case, we know like everything about what is the dimension of the vector space. Now we're going to go for the part one is like, we have a module form weight zero, and we know that the Fourier coefficients has Z bar coefficients. And then we want to actually give an upper bound of the dimension of the entire vector space. And this is like where the like algebraicity theorem or the arithmetic polynomial theorem plays in. So basically it's like, um, I think in the next couple of slides, I'm going to explain like why such a theorem would it actually give us a certain like dimension bound. So these theorems will give us a dimension bound which related to certain things that we can compute explicitly. And then with some input from Navidian theory, we'll be able to actually get an upper bound, which is not too far away from the first one. Because it's like, there's two parts I would like to explain is like, of course we are expected to have a dimension bound, which is at least n cube, because it's like we already see from the classical hex theory, it's like everything true is contained in one. So that's why like, we definitely expect to have a dimension which is at least n cube. And then here is like we get the dimension which is not the desired n cube, but not too far away from it. And the final contradiction, um, if you are interested, like you could read our paper, I'll explain later, but the essential contradiction comes from, let me just be brief here, the contradiction coming from that, like the log n doesn't really matter. If like we have one count, if we had one counter example, one could use kind of like replace tau by tau over p to construct a new counter example. By counter example, we mean that um, a module form with like z bar coefficients, but it is not congruent, whose level is not congruent. So using this trick, we can actually produce too many counter examples so that like uh, by too many, it's kind of, it violates the upper bound n cube log n that we have as like with that n goes to infinity. That's why like we get a contradiction. So in short, it's like the Wolfart kind of computation is like from his work classical. And then we have some extra input from like a uh, non-congruence module form saying that we don't need a like very sharp upper bound. We, we have some kind of like room that we can breathe, namely that n cubed times any power of log will be suffice for the things to work. And then we just need certain type of like good enough upper bound. And that is where we are going to use the so-called arithmetic polynomial theory. Okay. So before I move on talking about like arithmetic polynomial theorem, I would like to talk about a very special case of it first. So go back to the classical situation is like, I hope that kind of, it doesn't seem a little bit out of nowhere because it's like we're studying like module form with free coefficient to be algebra integers. So that's why here we have like a power series with integer coefficients. And then the easiest case we could say something is like, 
when the convergence radius is strictly greater than one, then like from calculus, the like, or you could fence, be fancy and do like Cauchy integration formula, that we know that um, the coefficients a n must be strictly smaller than n as n goes to infinity, and hence the only integer which has absolute value strictly smaller than one is zero. So that's why it's a polynomial. And of course, it's like from the arithmetic point of view, the Archimedean place is not kind of something special from like all the other periodic places. That's why we could just uh, like have a like a dedic version, which we are now considering convergence radius at all other primes. And but here we put a restriction saying that we only want like finitely many of them to be to could have possibility to be strictly smaller than one. And then, or more generally, in the broad work situation, they talk about the convergence radius of Marimorphy. They don't require, like, on a disk, the function to be holomorphic. Marimorphic is good enough, and the conclusion is a rational function. So these are the, like, classical work where people study power series and conclude that it's a rational function. And in our case, it's like we are not really going to be able to kind of use these type of rationality criteria because somehow like if you actually try to think about what the possible convergence radius we could say about our like module form, it's not large enough. So that's why like we can go a little bit further, which goes back to the work of Ivan J when he was working on this so-called algebraicity criteria. So the difference between the previous one and this one, we're still talking about like uh, power series with z coefficients, um, but like what if the convergence radius is too small? Is we can actually just look for maps from the unit disk to c where c has coordinate x. So instead of just looking at the disk around, just the disk around the zero and try to pick the largest possible disk, we say that we allow ourselves to study maps from a disk to C. And here the derivative actually is like the thing that we replace the convergence radius in the previous baby case. And of course, it's like this number, like if you pick the largest possible one, it should be, it is larger, it should be larger than the convergence radius that we talked before. And uh, so similarly, there's a dedic version. And uh, if we require this map to be injective, it gets some like rationality criteria and goes back to the work of Prodea Bertrandus. And what's more important is the proof is effective. So here's the thing is like in the work of like Evangelist, he did not just uh, prove that the function f is algebraic. He also proved that like he can use the function phi, or if you use like more places, just like all these kind of uh, uniformization from unit disk maps, and you use all these maps to actually give a like upper bound, explicit upper bound on the algebraic degree of the function. So that's the important part for us. And I would like to use module forms. So we'll see a version of this criteria later. Now, let me just uh, uh, summarize what is important is like we replace convergence radius by these kind of maps from a disk um, to the coordinate. And just uh, let's look at the example of module forms. And for simplicity, we just uh, study those ones with cusp with device two. That's why we can write as like Z bracket Q and restrict ourselves to z coefficient because the general case can also be reduced to this case. And recall like what is important for us is like lambda over 16 is q plus higher powers and the z coefficient, which means that if we have a power series with z coefficients in q, we can write it as a power series with z coefficients in x where x is lambda over 16. Okay, so now we have a power series in X. It has Z coefficients. Um, a priori, we know it's a rational function on a curve which admits a finite ramified covering to the lambda line. So it's algebraic over Q lambda. So like the, even if we can find a nice phi, which I'm going to explain like how, it's kind of like 
the first statement of the theorem is not enough. What we need is like, we need an upper bound of the algebraic degree. It's the same as saying here, we can actually can bound the degree of like this like. So we have a like Z coefficient module form F, it lies on some like module curve and we can actually bound the degree of this module curve over P1 and by using the kind of the actually effective upper bound from the algebraic degree coming from the theorem. Um, unfortunately, that the previous kind of like in the theorem in Andrew's book doesn't give us a good enough bound. So that's why we're going to do the following refinement. Okay, so I'm going to explain a little bit of the notation later because this is just the, for the purpose that we would like to incorporate the um, cusp width to be not necessarily two, that we need to do something else. And I would like to just first to display the theorem. It says like, let me just the emphasis on the part that we have a phi here. So we have a phi such that like two conditions. One is like the free coefficient has Z coefficient. The other is like when we kind of pull back to phi, it has a holomorphic function. So this is the kind of essentially, although kind of we put the N. So feel free to think about the situation where N equals to one, um, like as kind of it gives you the main part, like the main idea of the theorem is like, we have the Z coefficients part. And then we also have like, when we pull back by a map phi, it gives something which is holomorphic. And then overall we'll have a dimension bound, which is essentially using the function phi. It's like, we want the derivative to be as large as possible because it's like, mm, this is like what we replace the convergence radius. And we also want the function phi to not grow too quickly. Because if you think about like you would like to use like Cauchy integration theorem to like um, prove something which is similar to the baby case, then we would like to use like the for Cauchy integration formula to give some upper bounds of like um, the absolute value, which we know it's an integer. That's why it's at least one from the lower bound, if not zero. And that's why when we use this kind of integration theorem in complex analysis, we would like to control the size of the function phi that we use to pull back f. Okay, now go back to a little bit of the technical detail here is that uh, we have, so in general, we won't be able to talk about cusp with equals to two case. Then we have like t equals to q to the one over n. And also is like, instead of working with lambda over 16, we work with the nth roots of it. And then, so u is the familiar u that we've seen before is like take the nth roots of it. And so what is phi? Phi comes from the following is that we want a map, essentially it's like, we want to avoid the singularity. We want to avoid the cusps because cusps is where that we do not know how to extend our module forms over the cusps. And the, like the like complex analytics speaking, like is these are the singularity we probably won't be able to extend our power series over them. So we would like to avoid the cusps and but we want the derivative to be as large as possible to have a like small dimension bound here. So that's why the natural thing that if we know which points we want to avoid, the natural thing that we would do is take the universal covering. The universal covering is the one which gives the largest possible like derivative. And, but like in order to control the top part, I mean, so we just uh, shrink it a little bit so that we are not integrate on like, we need to pick a small closed disk inside the open disk and that's all. Okay, so I hope it's like, let's put this way is what does this term say? It says it's like, I still own you some explanation about like why condition one and two holds for all our module forms with like wolf at level N and also like have Z coefficients, although the Z coefficient part is kind of relatively obvious here. And uh, the choice is just the, like, the choice that we make for the phi here is to hope that we have a dimension which is not too big. And the more concrete speaking, 
that's the situation. So, so the Z part gives the condition one of the theorem and the Wolfart level. So here there's the one cusp that I intentionally did not mention, which is the cusp plus zero is because if, let me go back to the previous slides, it's like we do rule out all the like ants rules, but we did not rule out the cusp cusp zero. And we say we take the universal covering. So why is it good for us? That is because our assumption the wolf at level guarantees that the local monodromy at all these kind of weight zero module form, they are like rational functions on the big module curve and will have kind of local, they just looks like take the, at worst, they take the nth root. That's why when we take the lambda map, by the nth root, it already solved the kind of local finite monodromy. That's why we can actually extend our function over the zero cusp. So that's why it's like zero is different from the other ones. And this like weird looking like take nth roots is the purpose to solve the local singularity so that we can actually extend it over. Okay. Then like um, if one just uh, follow the previous thing and uh, just uh, do the explicit computation, which I'm not going to give more details, um, doing the explicit computation from the previous formula one really gets the n cube log n bind by some input also from the Navinia theory. I would like to mention that also in the recent work communicated to us by like Boss and the Shops, they can give an alternative Actually, they give two alternative proofs of our theorem with the constant E here replaced by two. So for our proof, for this application, it doesn't matter which constant we have here because in the end of the day, all we want is just uh, like a capital O of n cube log n. Um, but for the, um, okay, let me put this one. It's like, not for this application, we don't care about the coefficients. And hopefully in some future applications, we'll be able to see um, sometimes like having certain improvements would be like better. And uh, that's why I would like to talk about a kind of like, I will put it as a simplified version of what we can prove for the arithmetic conormicity theorem, which would also give us like the other application um, periodic data values. Uh, so let me first explain this theorem. And uh, so this theorem essentially looks similar to the previous theorem. Let me first point out what's in the previous theorem. So we said that we could replace E by two. So we have this integration, it just to take the lambda equals to zero case. So we have the integration here. And we also have the derivative here. Okay, so there's like two, uh, three other things pops out here. One is lambda, the other is log RP, the last one is sigma. The log RP part that you can feel free to ignore it because it's just a thing that we want to just uh, the easiest possible adetic version where we have like the periodic convergence radius in the condition three here. We want to have the periodic convergence radius to be at least RP. So that's just like a easy like adetic version. Actually more generally we could, instead of talking about convergence radius, one could also try to do these like mm, NJ type of maps. But for simplicity, that's just a stick with like periodic convergence radius. And the, the lambda part, which probably will show up in the last couple of slides, is that this is kind of give us a continuous way to like see a lot of like different um, arithmetic economy theorems. So the important part is the sigma. So let's look at the condition one here. The condition one here is like previously, in the previous application of the unbounded denominator case, we have like a Z coefficients, or you could do like Z to the one over M to make it the adelic version. That's completely fine. But like sometimes we'll have a denominator which of form like we take the square bracket here means the uh, least common multiple of one up to N to some integer power. So in the later application, so there's two parts of the story. One thing is like when, oh, a typical example I could give here is like think about the function fx equals to log one minus x. 
Okay, so the, for the function of log one minus x, you'll see that uh, it's not have z coefficients and the like power series, the Taylor expansion, you will have like one over n. So you have n show up on the denominator. The log x is kind of a, like commonly studied object in like Diophantine geometry. So we would like to take that into account. And then this, so that's where the sigma comes in. And also it's really, let me also say a little bit of the kind of the name of the theorem. So the theorem is still like when we consider all the functions with some control on the denominators of the power series. And then the condition two and three, you could think about it as like we have certain type of convergence radius at all the places. And so here we only say P divides M because for the others, we can trivially bound it by one. And then we are going to give a dimension upper bound of the vector space spanned by all these functions. And the homomorphicity coming from is like, unlike the situation when we do not have denominator. So when we have a function F with Z power, sorry, with Z coefficients, you raise to any power, you still have a Z coefficients power series. And it's kind of converge on the same disk uh, for like all kinds of conditions. But unfortunately, once we put into this denominator condition, we will not be able to just uh, raise to the power. If I say F square, then unfortunately I won't say that it have like denominator of this type one up to N to the Sigma. So that's why it's no longer an algebraicity theorem. And we, we also know that log one minus X is not an algebraic function. And, uh, but what is the kind of operation that one can do without like increase the denominator and having the same kind of convergence property that's taking derivative. And that explains the holonomity. It's like, instead of using F, F square powers of F to span a vector space of large dimension and talking about the algebraic degree. Here we are talking about F, the derivative of F, higher powers of derivative, like the iterative derivatives of F. So that will expand like a vector space with functions all satisfy the, like trivially satisfy all the conditions if our F satisfy the condition. And then the conclusion would be that uh, the differential module, which given by like F, F derivative, like iterative derivative of F will be a finite dimensional vector space. In other words, it's like F would satisfy a differential equation of finite order and we give an upper bound of the order of the differential equation. So that's the difference between like fit with denominator and without denominator case is like, we are like go beyond the situation of the algebra theorem. And we talk about these so-called arithmetic homonomies theorem. And so here is like, I'm going to give an example of like a different corollary that one could do like by choosing a different lambda. But first I would like to actually explain what is the denominator comes from? And that comes from that we can think about the baby case of the broader work of power series that we talked about before. In the situation where we have just the finitely many primes show up on the denominator, the proof can actually come in from a product formula. But unfortunately, it's like when we have just the Q coefficients instead of Z to the one over N coefficients, then like we cannot just directly exchange the summation because exchange the summation is not hold when we have actually like infinitely many things that we have to take care of. And uh, that's why there's kind of a so-called tau invariant introduced in the book of NJ where, which essentially measures the difference when you to the exchange of limit and the product formula thing that one could prove the baby case for z to the one over n. And, uh, and the generalization of the previous situation is like, so let me not flip back the slides, but saying recall is previously we said, if we have the summation of log rv strictly positive, then like when we are in the, 
just a finitely many denominator case, we have something as a polynomial. Now, if we have infinitely many primes show up on the denominator, then the generalization we should do is like the summation of the radius strictly greater than the tau function here, and then the conclusion that it is a polynomial. So this is, let me just flip back. This is related to the denominator because the first two terms is just the summation of like generalizations of convergence radius and then minus sigma in this case, one can actually compute sigma is exactly the tau invariant that using like Andre's definition. So like it says it's like, uh, if like we definitely want the denominator to be positive in order to have a meaningful dimension bound. Okay. So back to our case is let me just restate what's the situation that we use. It's like we have a bunch of functions and we have like the tau invariant smaller than sigma. We have the convergence radius and we have like for simplicity here, we just like manipulate the Archimedean space with a generalization of the radius, then the conclusion is like we could have such a dimension bound. So to compare to the previous case, when we have the integration bound, so previously we have the integration of the log source of this function, but unfortunately we have a coefficient two there. And then in this case, if the supremum is not too big, then the coefficient that we could put here is one. So here is just a kind of, you can choose the lambda in the previous theorem like wisely so that you could get a like basically a family of dimension bound and it depends on what type of problem that we try to solve. Some cases like different, them, different lambda will give like better bounds or the other case. Okay, so, uh, okay, good. Let me just uh, summarize is like, um, Basically, what is our input? It's like for each place, we want to have certain type of like generalization of the convergence radius and depends on like how good the function is. And then we can actually cook up a dimension bound in terms of all these uniformizations. And I would like to talk about, uh, so in the book of NJLG G functions, given that he already introduced the like tau invariant, he also had a version of the bound of the dimension, just the bound is like not as good as the one that we present here. Okay, so I would like to actually give the second application of today for the previous theorems about like the like zeta values. Let me just quickly go through like uh, the classical situation is that we have the Riemann zeta function. We consider the zeta values and then conjecturally, we expect that all these are algebraically independent over Q and there are previous results for zeta two and zeta three. And we will not be able to say anything about the classical zeta value five, um, but in the periodic situation, life is a little bit easier. So the periodic zeta value can be defined as like the limit, like. So re remove the P part and take the limit of like the zeta value once we take the limit in the periodic sense. Um, so the limit exists uh, based on like Kummer's congruence condition on the Bernoulli numbers. Or the other thing one could think about are these are like constants of like periodic Eisenstein series as like periodic Eisenstein series can also be achieved by like interpreted like the like classical Eisenstein series. And in the work of Frank Caragari in 2005, he proved that the like two addict and three addict zeta value as three are not rational using the overconvergent Eisenstein series. And using the dimension bound that I just showed earlier, that we're able to prove that the two addict zeta value at five is not rational. So, the definition gives us like a number inside Q2. And what we can do is to prove that this number inside Q2 is actually a number inside Q2, not rather than a rational number. Okay, so I would like to recall a little bit from like Frank's work about like what is the like Eisenstein series and how did he actually 
set of things to use the overconvergence. Okay, so as I said, like these like uh, periodic zeta values can be actually realized as like the constant term of a periodic module form with weight in this case negative two k, and uh, we can pair it with a classical module form to make it into something of weight zero, and also for x not two. It's a rational curve and then it has a Hobson module. So we have the product of a weight 2K and a weight negative 2K module form. So we get something weight zero. We can write it as a power series, like in terms of the Hobson module of this module curve. And we would like to actually study this power series. So what do we know about? Okay, so we're going to study this power series and apply our like arithmetical normal theorem. And the, ah, sorry, there's a typo here. And that um, we are going to, since we're going to talk about like the periodic data value at five, which means we are going to take the case that k equals to two. For k equals to two, so this is a weight minus four module form. This is a weight four module form. Then we can actually run the argument, a model geometry type of computation to see that actually indeed, is like these functions. So four is related to the two K here. So these functions are all linearly independent. Like the smallest kind of degree of uh, differential equation that such function would satisfy need uh, like degree five differential operator. So these things are linearly independent. So we at least have an lower bound of the space that we're going to study if we assume for contradiction that the periodic data value is rational. So what about the radius? So the radius is like, since it's a like weight negative 2K module form. So we see that on the denominator, it will have N to the 2K plus one. And the, the classical, one is essentially like Z coefficients and the Hobson module is also Z coefficients. So when we put things together is that we know that derivative doesn't change convergence radius. So we can just think about F. So it has like the periodic convergence radius to be at least one for all the primes. And the, and the here is the extra like over convergence comes in is like in this case, we can have more about the true addict convergence radius. We could have a true addict convergence radius to be two to the 12, which is like the one on the disk union all the super singular locus. And then so, ah, so the denominator comes from 2K plus one. So the tau, sorry, the sigma in this case is actually 2K plus one. And then for the phi is, so we want to have something such that the, the log, the summation of the log of the radius is strictly greater than five. And the, so if we take just the, take the log of like this one, we'll get 12 log two, and it is indeed strictly greater than five. And so which means is like, we want to have our like Archimedean radius to be also not too small. And one of the large ones is that we can take the, just the, the Q coordinate. Q coordinate gives us something such that the derivative is one. But unfortunately, if you just take the super large disk there, we will not be able to have something such that the supreme of phi is small. So like the formula says, let me just flip back a little bit. So the formula here says is like, we already have a like, the two, 12 log two, which is very big, and our sigma is equals to five. So we want to kind of find the like a region, not necessarily a disk inside it. We would like to find a region inside the Q coordinate disk, such that this one is not too small, so that we still have this one positive, and this one is not too large. This is kind of a very concrete like have some module we can actually study like its growth behavior and we were able to actually let me not give details about like what is the precise choice 
I mean, as there are kind of multiple choice one can make. Is like so one could actually just like choose a suitable region to avoid those places where like the function phi gets too large, and then we get a dimension bound from our theorem to be at most six. So let me just uh, summarize. It's like we use the like periodic over convergence to have a larger radius. We use the Q expansion, some part of the Q expansion, and our holonomicity theorem to give the dimension bound to be at most six. And on the other hand, we do have like six functions if we assume for contradiction that this is a rational number. That gives us contradiction because all these six functions are linearly independent. So what goes wrong, the conclusion is like, ah, we just should not have a uh, like F here. Like, so one is okay. One is rational, that's fine, but we should not just have the function f here because it should not have q coefficients. Should it should just never exist in this like um, vector space that we study about, like convergence radius, blah blah blah, these type of things. Okay, so and then so as the conclusion that this like periodic zeta values is just irrational. Um, Okay, since I only have three minutes left, I would just like to display the slides about a little hint about like how one actually prove the arithmetic holonomicity theorem. And this is inspired by the work of Boss, previous work of Boss Shamua, and also reading the work of Boss Shams, that we try to revisit the slope method, like in the Earlier work of Boss tried to just manipulate things to see what type of, to get, a, I will put it this way, like a uniform proof of the uh, arithmetic holonomy theorem. Um, in our paper, we proved like the theorems using like legal lemma. And here is like using the slope method, we could have like at least so far a uniform bound which sees different color rates. And the upshot is like we construct a, Z module, which is essentially just the, the um, function F along with like some polynomials. These are the way that we construct auxiliary polynomials with high vanishing order. And now here, I'm finally at the moment to explain lambda. Lambda is like, so this Z module is something that we know that we're going to study. And in order to apply the slope method, we need to make it into a emission module. And the lambda here is just the, the different choice of norm that we put here. So given different choice of norm, since it's a different emission module, we get different estimates in this kind of slope inequality about the arithmetic degree of the uh, emission module and also the height of the function, which is coming from like take the n's coefficient map from these filtrations filtered by the vanishing order. And uh, so then like once one set up the slope kind of method, when just uh, estimate all these terms, when estimate the arithmetic degree and also the height bound and the putting things together, we get our holonomicity bound, which is something depends on lambda. And uh, then we just uh, choose the suitable lambda for each question in order to get a good upper bound. So let me just uh, stop here. Thank you very much for your attention.